Hello, my name is Austin Deering, and thank you so much for coming to this video. Today, I'm gonna to be walking through how to increase your sales exponentially using this powerful marketing formula. Now, you might be saying to yourself, self, I don't work in marketing, I work in sales. And that's exactly my point. As marketers, we send out hundreds and hundreds of emails, and we have kind of narrowed down the best way to get as many clicks and impressions as possible on those emails. So let's dive into exactly how to get this going. So in this masterclass, I will be teaching you how to write subject lines that are unique, specific, and helpful so that your prospects will open and click your emails more effectively. I'm going to teach you how to keep your emails out of the Gmail promotions tab or worse, the spam folder. I'm going to help you construct a high performing lead magnet that works into getting your prospects attention, time and getting their email addresses. Okay. Now I want to go through um, the tools that I use and the resources that I've gathered and I'm going to put them all in one place. Um, put them down in the description here so you can click them. You can check them all out, but let's just go over everything. Okay, now these resources that I'll be talking to you about are, they're just referring to the links that we have in the description and I want you to refer to them as often as you can so that you can immediately improve your emails and make sure that they are delivered successfully. Now we recommend using sprout.io to store all of your important bookmarks related to these work projects. It's free, it's really easy to use, plus you won't run the possibility of losing those bookmarks in your drunk drawer that is everyone's bookmark folder. Okay. Now let's go over some tools and resources that I use to help my emails gather better clicks and better engagement. Now the first one I'm gonna go over is Portance Content Idea Generator. Okay, let me give you an example. Let's say you're trying to reach prospects who have an interest in Generation Z. So now you're gonna use Generation Z as your keyword. Importance Co Content Idea Generator will give you the following headlines. Seven movies with unbelievable scenes about Generation Z. The 16 best resources for Generation Z or Darth Vader's guide to Generation Z. It's important to know that I'm not just gonna put the headline into my email uh, or just use the headline that Portance Tools gives me. It's really important that I go back and I edit, but I, but I gathered the headlines from this because those might be clickable headlines or researched terms um, and types of headlines that people have clicked on in Google and stuff in the past. So let me give you some examples that I, I rewrote these headlines um, so that I can kind of describe to you what I'm aiming at here, if that makes sense. Um, and, I, and I used an, actually another tool that's in our description called Optin Monsters 700 Power Words to boost your conversations and conversions and 380 persuasion power words. Now, obviously words matter. Don't let anybody tell you differently. One or two power words in your subject line can make all the difference between a prospect opening your email and skipping right by it. That's why they're called power words. Power words have the power to stop a reader and capture their attention. Some examples of some power words include astonishing, myths, or secrets. Now let's try those in a few of the subject lines that Portent's content generator created for us so we can edit those content lines like I was telling you about. Astonishing truths about Generation Z revealed inside. Myths and fact about your Generation Z prospects. Generation Z secrets to pay close attention to in 2022. See, now those were a lot more catchy and engaging, and that's just because we plugged in those power words from the Optin Monsters Power Word Generator. Now, another tool that we're gonna be going over is HubSpot's The Ultimate List of 394 Email Spam Trigger Words to Avoid. Spam trigger words are the opposite of power words. Using them excessively, if you use them at all, will cause your email to skip the inbox every single time and find itself in the promotions tab. And emails in the promotions tab do not have a high probability of ever being opened. In fact, only two out of every 10 emails sent in total are ever opened in Gmail. So if you throw them into the promotions tab, they're not being opened at all. Let me give you some example of some spam trigger words that you really want to stay away from or else you get banished to the spam folder. Okay. Meet Generation Z singles in your area. Obviously, red flag straight to the spam folder. Earn extra cash by selling steak knives to members of Gen Z. Again, straight to the spam folder. Are you a member of Generation Z? There's an incredible deal inside for you. 
and again, straight to the spam folder. Okay, the next tool that we're gonna be going over is Copy Blogger's 22 best headline formulas that work, and they have some templates. If you're not terribly creative, and a lot of us aren't because you know we're too busy or too stressed or too overwhelmed with the chaos of living in the 21st century, then don't worry. There are some formulas here that you can use to do all the subject line writing work for you. Then you can just pop in the power words, upgrade what you have, and send away. The following are three of the 22 copy formulas that Copy Blogger recommends you use. The secret to blank. You see this one a lot in your inbox, actually. You might need to add a word in if it doesn't flow properly, like the secret to Gen Z doesn't sound so good, but the secret to understanding Gen Z sounds much better. That's what I mean by flow. Use the formula and get everything straightened around. But then say that subject line out loud and ask yourself, do I sound like a real person saying this? And if you don't, then just tweak it. Next formula would be get rid of problem once and for all. When you contact any prospect, you're in the problem solving business. If you don't know what your customer's top three problems are, you shouldn't be sending them any sort of marketing messages until you do. Using this formula, you would identify one of the customer's problems in your subject line. So in the workplace, Gen Z has the following problems. They want to work where they want, when they want, and how they want, which can often be asynchronous without any face-to-face -face meetings. A headline sent to an HR manager trying to recruit members of Gen Z might sound like, get rid of your office once and for all. Get rid of the nine to five schedule once and for all. Get rid of meetings once and for all. But another note about the get rid of problem formula once and for all, is that it often presents an opportunity to be rewritten as how to get rid of your problem once and for all. I personally like how to's better than the get rid of because it seems to convert better in the emails that I send out. But you'll need to test this hypothesis on your own and figure out if your specific audience likes it or not. Okay, and the next formula is give me short time period and I'll give you blank. What makes this headline so powerful is the time element. If you can master the use of time in your subject line and sales copy, you'll almost always convert a customer to a sale. This is because the time element creates a sense of urgency. I know, this may sound obvious, but you'd be surprised to learn that it's not as well known as you'd think. So, in this instance, offering someone a specific and measurable amount of time increases the likelihood that they'll open your email. Think of it this way. If I ask you if you're interested in being interviewed, you don't know how long of time commitment that might be, so there's a chance you'll say no. But if I answer that question before you think to ask it, the probability goes up that you'll say yes to my request. By giving a specific and measurable amount of time, a prospect knows exactly what they're getting and when they're getting it, and for how long from you. That open-ended commitment just became something specific and measurable. So here are some examples that I would use in an email to HR managers interested in recruiting Gen Z. Give me 15 minutes and I'll give you three keys to understanding Gen Z. Give me five minutes and I'll give you one secret every HR manager should know about Gen Z. Give me 10 minutes and I'll give you, you know, you fill in the blank. Just a word of caution though. These headlines are great, but also kind of long. 12 words or less should always be your goal. Six or seven words is even better given the small amount of screen on a mobile device. So that second headline, I'd even re rewrite it to say, give me five minutes and put in your prospect's name to talk Gen Z with you. So give me five minutes, Susie, to talk Gen Z with you. And here's a pro tip. Reuse your great subject lines as the first line of your LinkedIn status update to capture people's attention on that platform. Now here's another tool. Oh, let's convert over to tools rather than resources, should I say. Sprout.io that we mentioned earlier. Okay, let's go over this one. I'm gonna post a screenshot right here displaying what Sprout.io looks like and displaying the bookmarks that we've shared so far with you. Now before we move on to the next section, if you're going to be sending high volume e emails either from your company's email or an email service provider like ConvertKit, which I do highly recommend, there are two paid tools for you also to consider. Now keep in mind, 
You don't need these tools if you're on a budget, but once you find yourself sending hundreds of emails a day, they are very worth adding to your arsenal to ensure maximum deliverability. The first paid tool would be Glock Apps. They say, with our mail tester tool, delivery and open rates are phenomenal. What's great about Glock apps is that you get three free spam tests to try out in their inbox insight tool, Send Forensics. Now, Send Forensics is another paid tool that offers no credit card, 14 day free trial. So if you wanna try it out, I would definitely go that way. But what they do is they're an email spam checker and a spam test for your emails and they give you a spam score. That helps you keep your emails out of the spam folder and out of the Gmail promotions tab. All right, we went over all the tools and resources and now I wanna go into the next step. So step two is all about building a swipe file. Hello, my name is Austin Deering and thank you so much for coming to this video. Today, I'm gonna to be walking you through how to increase your sales exponentially using this powerful marketing formula. Step two, is all about building a swipe file. Now, you read headlines multiple times a day, all throughout the day, depending on whether or not you're looking at your phone before or maybe after you'll start looking at it, or maybe even looking at it right now, you're going to see a lot of headlines. Don't just scroll through them. If a headline stops and makes you think or makes you click on it or tap on it, write that headline down. If you saw a headline that you really liked, Write that one down too. See, I use the onion heavily as a teaching tool because they are masters at headline writing. Later in this masterclass, I'll show you how to write better headlines as well, just like they do. But for now, here are three headlines from the onion that I recently added to my swipe file inside of sprout.io. Now I'm gonna give a screenshot right here. Here's my headlines. Um, let me just give you one of them. Elon Musk tries to back out of the Twitter deal by deleting the app from his phone. Obviously, The Onion is a facetious site, but that's very comedic, very engaging, and you want to click and read the article. Now, the swipe file will save you so much time and energy because what you'll find is that sitting and generating a ton of headlines is not a scalable solution. You're busy and you have a lot of other things that you need to do. That's where the swipe file comes in. With a good swipe file, you can collect all the best headlines you've ever encountered and you can have a deep library to borrow them for your own emails. A word about stealing. As the cliche or Pablo Picasso quote goes, good artists borrow and great artists steal. As long as you're taking the stuff and making it your own, don't get hung up about borrowing other people's headlines because what they're doing works. And if you put in your own topics to your own prospects, it will not be plagiarism. If it works, then use it. That's been the mantra in the world of copywriting and direct marketing for a hundred years now. Many of the best copywriters when teaching copywriting often talk about their own swipe files that they've built up over the years. So in the same way, we're all going to save the planet, reduce, reuse, recycle, is the same formula here for using the headlines you save up in your swipe file. Just make sure to make them your own before you send them out. And another note, there is a difference between a swipe file, as described right here in this masterclass, and a reference file. At my company, we use a software called Confluence as a reference file. Other companies use Notion and other ones still use Google Drive. The difference between a swipe file and a reference file is that a reference file in the world of copywriting refers to internal documentation, something you or your company uses to collect information on your customer, like a customer persona or a SWOT analysis. That kind of stuff goes in the reference file. Only headlines that catch your attention and that you like go into your swipe file. Okay, now we're gonna move on to step three. 80% of good copywriting is research. Adelia Ravel's buyer persona book talks about deep, seated buyer personas. Let me give you a quick overview. So the first step of understanding a persona is to interview your target audience. Who are the people you are marketing to? Do they want the solution to the problem that you are selling? It's not just about demographics. Who asks the deeper questions? Who has the deeper desires? 
who has the problem? Take me back to the day that you first decided to buy the solution and tell me what happened. That's a great question that you want to ask your current customers so you can understand your persona just a little bit better. You are looking for the buyer trigger. What caused this person to act? How did they even research providers like you? Keep asking what else, what else, what else? What did you do that day? What did you decide to do that day? What did you research that day? Keep asking what else so you understand that persona's buyer action and that you can put that into your persona. Step two, when you talked to your peers or friends or colleagues that went on Google, what were you trying to find? What did they do next? What were the success factors that had them click on one link or another? Now you can ask them about any product in this space. So say you're researching a car. What made you want to click on Toyota versus Ford? What were the decisions and the steps they took that day? We can then compartmentalize this data and apply it into a general prospect understanding of the persona in not just our friends or peers or colleagues, but like the process of purchasing a car. What did they do, right? Those are gonna be some of the questions we asked during those interviews. Step three is what stood out about us? So the, back to the interview of your persona, of your customer, you wanna ask them what stood out about us, about me, about the product that I'm selling or you're selling compared to your competitor. What stuck out about them, right? What did your company do successfully? What did my company do successfully? What did your competitor fail to do that made them want to purchase from you? Now, these are the perceived barriers. I want you to write down all of these insights. Like if they used the website, if they used Google, if they saw them on LinkedIn, and, and what does each of these barriers mean? Okay, step four is the decision criteria. All the questions they were asking about this journey, throughout this whole journey. What questions did your customer ask and how did they find the answers to them? And step five is that buyer journey and identifying each of the steps and how did they Google them, where did they go to find them, and what did they listen to the most? What defined the credibility of the resource that your customer looked into? Now in the description below, I'm gonna put in another link and it's the buyer persona templates and it's just a free download. There's some questions on there. You can ask your customers to understand your persona deeper. Um, you can use Amazon gift cards to kind of incentivize your customers. Um, to answer these questions for you. So just set up that interview, have your product team set up that interview, have your marketing team set up that interview um, and incentivize them. Give, them. give them a reason to give you authentic and true answers. And then how do you know when to stop the interviews? After 10 questions, after asking all the questions you can think of, are you hearing the same things over and over? Um, what is it? The key here is to understand when you have an overall general strong picture of what your persona looks like usually after 10 interviews, that's when you can move on to the next step. You can use tools like Riverside to create high quality recordings of your customer interviews. Zoom is fine too, um, or even Google Meets, so that you can use that to go back and review your customer interviews. And you can learn and kind of watch the reactions to your questions, so that way you have a further understanding of why they purchased from you. That is so important, that's what we wanna know is why that persona purchased from you. It's not just about who they are, right? It's not about these demographics, it's not about the age. Obviously that comes into play, but the key reason is why they purchased. Interview your losses as well, not just your wins. So if you can have your product or your marketing team reach out to somebody that ended up going with a competitor, you wanna to come to the conclusion of why the competitor became a better solution for that specific loss. That is also a crucial detail because if you can understand what your competitor is doing, rinse and repeat, reduce, reuse, recycle, right? Do the same thing that they're doing to gather their personas that are coming in and flip them to your own. Now give your persona a real name and a real picture and make it real to you. You can go on some sort of stock image website and just pull up a stock image of a female or a male or whoever it is that you want and say, hey, this is my buyer persona. These are all their traits. This is why they purchased from us. You want this to be a real authentic person. Give it a name so that way you can reference it. You're like, well, actually, um, Susie, our buyer persona, um, would not agree with you. 
And that way you can have an authentic, incredible source of all this information and all that data living under one person and one common name. 80% of people do not buy the better solution because they had an awful sales experience. Give them a good sales experience. Understand your user, understand your persona, understand your buyer, and give them the experience that they want to have. Your job is to research, find out the answers, go through these interviews, speak like they do, act like they do, give them the answers that they need to hear so that they're willing to switch and purchase from you. Okay, let's go over the value equation. Value equals the dream outcome times the likelihood of achievement, all divided by the time delay times the effort and sacrifice. Okay, dream outcome, does it solve my problem? Likelihood of achievement, will I achieve my outcome? Will this achieve the proper outcome? Time delay, are the results quick? And effort and sacrifice, does it require a lot of effort? Are there additional costs? Are there additional meetings? Is there additional sales cycle? That is our value formula. I want you to go through and get at least 10 interviews of your personas Examine your Google Analytics data closely and then merge it to your Facebook audience data so that it help complete your buyer persona work. Now, this may need some help from your product team, this may need some help from your marketing team, but if you can get your hands on this data and put it all together, then you can have a better understanding of your persona. You need to write to everyone as if you know them inside and out. What that means for us is that you need to know what keeps the person or persona you're writing to up at night. What are the problems they're facing? What are the three biggest problems that they currently have? Take them out to eat. Go to conferences where they're having conversations and listening. Do whatever it takes to know your persona so well that you won't have any trouble coming up with headlines that will capture their interest. You won't know how to make your offer as compelling as possible unless you know what your target audience pain points are or what things that they are tired of. And there's one other secret that I want to share with you. I want to go over crafting your offer and kind of just share with you what it means to craft an offer and the best way to do that. So I'm going to go over the list of steps and then I'm going to give you an example of each of those steps so that you can follow along clearly. So step one, choose a desired outcome and focus on value creation. Okay. An example of this was I want to lose weight in six weeks. Next step would be list down your problems. Example would be eat healthy and buying food is a hassle and it's costly. List down the solutions. Example, I want a meal plan, pre-made Instacart, ready delivery. And last step, how to deliver these solutions. A subscription service, do it for you, deliver directly to your doorstep. Simple as that. Here is an if then exercise. If your target persona has this problem, then this is how your product can solve that problem, right? If then, same thing as a hypothesis. If then because, if then. Step one, write down as many customer pain points as you can after the if. If your target persona has problem staying up at night, problem eating healthy, problem going to the gym, problem lifting heavy weights, problem running on the treadmill, problem driving to the gym, problem thinking about the gym, right? Write down as many problems and customer pain points that you can think of after the if. And step two is write down as many of your solutions provided by your product or tool after the then. If your target persona has this problem, then this is how your product can solve that problem. Now I'll tell you the secret. People really don't like to be sold to. You know that, you're in sales. Nobody likes to be sold to, which is why it's important to get to know them so well so you can craft copy and messages in such a way that solves their problems without them feeling like they're being sold to and without them feeling like the problems are being solved in a sales type manner. One thing we're doing on the marketing team is we're creating these mini videos on email marketing that clearly demonstrate the value of our product to complete the lesson without actually selling our product directly, right? 
But that's not the secret. The secret is that people buying something are buying something for two reasons. First is to solve their problem. But second, there's also a benefit behind the benefit of the problem that your product solves. So here at Serious Insight, we're creating these mini video series to teach you about marketing, about sales content, about copywriting, about marketing in general. And the secret behind it is we're just trying to implement our tool into as many scenarios as possible. But there's also the benefit behind our problem, which may be a similar problem to what you have, right? We're using our tool to show you how to do things. And you say, now I know how to do these things. Also, that tool looks really great. Can I learn more about it? Let me put this another way. When you buy Domino's, the benefit is the pizza. Sure. But there's an also added benefit of getting the pizza delivered to your house quickly. So they're also selling you speed and convenience in addition to the pizza. Does that make sense? You're watching this video to learn sales and marketing tips for writing great headlines and just getting better conversions on your emails. But there's an added benefit to it as well. One thing we have zeroed in on is that serious insight saves time. But time to do what? So an example of solving a problem and providing a benefit behind the benefit is that we save sales professionals time that they can use to invest in upskilling themselves to sell more and to get more sales, get a higher commission, right? Another thing you should do is create an elevator pitch. But how do you do that? An elevator pitch is simple. Put in your customer's main motivation plus their main objection and use the word without. For example, our tool brings the gym to you without the need of a subscription service, right? Simple, uh, just for a gym equipment thing. Our gym, our tool brings the gym to you without the need of a subscription service. That is an elevator pitch. That's how you sell quickly. Welcome back to step three. 80% of good copywriting is research. In step three, we're going to go over a couple different things. And in this first section, we're going to go over buyer personas. So here's a question you'll be surprised to learn the answer to. Have you talked to your customers recently? The most frequent response I get is no. So we're going to take a minute or two here and talk about what a buyer persona is and what a buyer persona is not. And I'm even going to give you the questions you need to ask to build a solid buyer persona. A buyer persona is not a fictional character with characteristics you'd like them to have or think that they might have. One thing you'll find is that once you start talking to your customers, your assumptions about them go right out the window. A buyer persona is a real person whose characteristics you have learned about by speaking with them about their real pain points. I'm going to repeat that. A buyer persona is a real person, one whose characteristics you have learned about by speaking with them about their real pain points. If you don't have a buyer persona in mind for any of your outreach efforts, you'll either fail or pay way too much money than you should be to get that person's attention. So we're going to talk briefly here about how to construct a buyer persona. First things first, you're going to want to interview at least 10 people who match your target audience. If you do less than 10, you won't start to hear patterns forming. The patterns are the most important aspects of constructing an accurate persona. In interviewing your target audience, the goal of each interview is to answer the question, does your target audience want the solution that you're selling? Customer problems, the most lucrative ones anyways, usually revolve around health, wealth, and relationships. Framing what you're selling in such a way that solves one or more of these pain points will always increase the probability of success. During the interview, you'll want to pay close attention to those details. So start your interview by asking, take me back to the day you first decided to buy our product, and then tell me what happened. You should always start with this question. Why? Because you're looking to identify your target market's buying trigger. Or in less fancy words, the thing that caused the customers to act. 
So every detail matters. Then you'll want to ask, how do you research companies like our company? What did you Google? What podcast did you listen to? What websites did you look up? What social media platforms did you pay attention to? And this information is just so crucial in order to identify the right platform to reach your target audience. It's not enough just to go about using Google. I want you to find out where they went after they searched you on Google. And of course, you want to understand what they searched for. What terms did they use? What questions did they ask Google and YouTube? Next, you want to ask what stood out about you and what stood out about your competitors that they might have come across. What did your company do successfully that other competitors did not do? What did your company not do well that other competitors did? Yes, there are still more questions to ask, which is why it's important to pause here and encourage you to keep your question and answer session brief. Don't waste anyone's time. Make your customers feel comfortable and ask their permission to record. We recommend a great tool called Riverside. It's really easy and it just produces high quality recordings, but use whatever software you want to use. If you can, you should also compensate your customer for their time in the form of an Amazon gift card. One tactic to think about later, you can spice up your question and answer sessions by using a service like Oh Yeah, which gives kind of a sort of fun background and aura to the entire screen and you can share customizations throughout the entire interview process. All right, let's keep moving forward. It is imperative that you don't just interview the customers you won. You also want to interview as many customers as you can that you didn't win, the ones you lost. I recommend making customer Q and A's a regular part of your schedule and designate the knowledge keeper in your organization to keep track of that data to make sure that the buyer persona is always up to date and accurate. You probably don't have time to do all that, so how many interviews should you do? You should do as many interviews as you can until you start hearing the same things over and over, until that pattern forms. Then you can stop. When conducting interviews with customers you lost, make sure to ask them why and how they came to the conclusion that your competitor was a better fit than you were. What did you do wrong? What did your competitor do right? Buyer persona expert Adele Ravella revealed that many customers ended up not purchasing a better solution because of their poor experience during the sales cycle. Finally, if you're currently tracking your customers with Facebook audience data and Google Analytics, you want to merge those two fields together along with the data you just collected from the interviews. You can and will interview as many of your customers as you can, but you obviously can't catch them all. So although the buyer persona is heavily qualitative, this is where you want to make use of the additional quantitative data that you get from Google Analytics and Facebook audience, because you want to see if you can spot additional patterns of interest. The more accurate you are in analyzing this data, the less money you'll have to spend later on in advertising. That's because you'll be creating content that's so custom made for your customer and solving that their, and their problem that they won't wanna go anywhere else. If you follow the links below this video, you'll find a free buyer persona template and questions you can ask to start gathering this sort of information. Before we move on, let's recap the questions you should be asking in order to construct your buyer persona. Remember, the goal of your 10 interviews is to answer the following question. Does your audience want the solution that you're selling for their problem. Here are the questions. Take me back to the day when you first decided to buy blank and tell me what happened. How do you research companies like blank? What did you Google? You want the exact search terms that are used here. What did you listen to? What did you watch? What medium did you use to learn about blank? What stood out to you about blank? What stood out to you about Blank's competitors? What didn't you like about Blank's competitors' offerings? What did the competitors not do well? What did we do successfully to win your business? And here are the questions you want to ask the losses. What did we do wrong to make you conclude that we weren't the solution for you? 
And how did you come to the conclusion that our competitor was a better choice for you? Okay, now that we understand personas, we go out to dive into our value proposition. So by now, I've stressed how important it is to get out there and speak with those customers and your potential prospects. In the event that the message hasn't sunk in yet, let me repeat it really quick here. You want to know your prospects inside and out. How do you do this? Take them out to eat. Go to conferences. Go to places where they're having conversations about their problems and listen to them. Do whatever it takes to know your customer so well that you won't have a problem coming up with great subject lines that draw their interest. It's important to have a deep understanding of how this prospect thinks. Because, as Nobel Prize winning psychologists Daniel Kahneman and Amos Doversky demonstrated, when people are dealing with uncertainty and anxiety, they fall back onto a very simple mental framework to make the decisions for them. So, when using the internet, my hypothesis is that people default back to three simple questions that help them form and inform almost all the decisions that they're making. One, what's in it for me? Two, what are my three biggest problems that I'm facing right now? And three, how will this thing that you're trying to buy or trying to sell, how will this thing or doing this thing make me look among my peers? The only way you'll be able to answer those questions and write great subject lines and pitches that get your prospects attention is knowing the answers to these three questions. Simple enough, right? You have not succeeded in this endeavor until you can answer with your eyes closed what your customer's top three problems are. Why? Because you'll need that information to craft a value proposition that makes what you're selling irresistible. The only way to succeed at anything in life is to give more than you get, right? And ideally, you're giving without the assumption that you'll get something in return. But moral dilemmas and ethics are beyond the scope of today's masterclass. So what is in the scope of today's masterclass is writing great copy. Because great copy means great headlines, and great headlines can turn into great subject lines. And great subject lines mean emails that get opened, and open emails leads to deals closing. Before we get into headlines, there's one more thing that we have to do, and that is to generate your value proposition based on the answers to the three previous questions. The goal is to craft a value proposition so powerful that your customer feels stupid not to act on it. In order to craft a great value proposition, you must answer these four questions with the information that you have gathered thus far. Number one, does it solve my prospect's problem? Number two, will it help them achieve their desired outcome? Number three, how quick will the customer see these outcomes? And number four, does the thing you're proposing require a lot of effort to make work? The answer should always be yes, yes, almost immediately, and no. It's easier said than done. So you'll want to tweak and modify what you're offering until the answers are yes, yes, almost immediately, and no. Here's a framework to use to help you create and craft a great value proposition. One, identify what your prospect's dream outcome is. Two, identify all the problems your prospect facing in achieving that outcome. Three, identify all the solutions to that problem. Four, identify one solution that could give your customer a quick win right now while also helping them understand how long it will take for them to successfully reach their dream outcome. A quick win will help them commit to whatever you're selling over the long term because they will immediately see the value in it. Five, write down how you plan to deliver these solutions to the prospect. And six, write down ways to streamline these solutions in such a way that they are easy to act on for the prospect. That's it, that's the formula. Yes, yes, almost immediately, and no. Phrase your findings in such a way that answers those questions and you're now that much closer to getting and closing a sale. And now, here's an exercise to help you write a killer value proposition. It's called the If, 
then exercise. Step one, write down as many customer pain points as you can after the word if. This will help you think in terms of who, what, and how, which is how your value proposition should be framed. In this example, we're going to use a webinar. Example, if a CMO of a B2B SaaS company, that's the who, wants to produce a high quality webinar, okay, now we're gonna move on to the then. Step two is now write down as many of your solutions provided by your product after the then. In the example, if a CMO of a B2B SaaS company, that's the who, wants to produce a high quality webinar to attract prospective customers, the what, then they need to learn about story structure. That's the how. Now set a timer for 15 minutes and write down as many hows as you can in 15 minutes. A secret about why we buy. Now, I'll tell you the secret. People don't like to be sold to, which is why it is important to get to know them so well that you can craft copy and messaging in such a way that solves their problems without them feeling like they're being sold to. One thing we're doing on the marketing team here at Serious Insight is we're creating mini videos on email marketing that clearly demonstrate the value of using Serious Insight to complete the task we're discussing this week without actually selling Serious Insight directly. So we show the product in action as we solve customers' problems. But that's not the secret. The secret is that people buy something for two reasons. First is to solve their problem. But second is they want the benefit behind the benefit of the problem that your product solves. Let me put this another way. When you buy a Domino's pizza, the benefit is the pizza. Sure, but there's also the added benefit of getting the pizza delivered to your house quickly. So they're also selling you speed and convenience in addition to the pizza. That's the benefit behind the benefit. You're buying the pizza, but you're also buying reliability and speed in the delivery of that pizza. One thing we've zeroed, up, zeroed in on is that Serious Insight will save you time. But time to do what? So an example of solving a problem and providing a benefit behind the benefit is that we save sales professionals time that they can use to invest in themselves to, you know, make more sales. So that's the benefit behind the benefit, and that's why people purchase. All right, now we're gonna move on to step four, and I'm gonna teach you how to create infinite headlines in the next video. All right, welcome back. Today in step four, we're gonna go over how to create infinite headlines. I'm going to give you two different ways to generate infinite headlines. So let's go over what we need to do first. I'm gonna give you some general guidelines you need to follow when it comes to writing these headlines. So, the basics. Keep the subject line to 12 words or less. Six to seven words, even better. Use adjectives. The number seven does really well, and so do other odd numbers. Make headlines rationale unique. It must answer the question for you, why am I sending this? And for your prospect, has to answer, why am I reading this? Make the headline ultra specific. The customer should feel like you're walking into a conversation that they've already been having with themselves. Always deliver on what your headline promises. Use the words what, when, why, and how. Use things people like, provide in your headline. Tips, reasons, lessons, tricks, ideas, ways, principles, facts, secrets, and strategies. And now, here are just some basic guiding principles. Remember that the subject line is not where you make your sale. It's only to get them to open the email. Let your site and its content do the selling for you. With your emails, you just want a reply or a link click. If you push too hard on sales, you may wind up in the spam folder. And this is why lead magnets are so effective. If you have a simple one pager as a lead magnet, that's something that you can send to a prospect and have them open to open your email 
and then they click on something within your email and then download a lead magnet, it is incredibly helpful and useful in solving one of their pain points. But no, you never want to send an attachment to anyone ever even your best friend. Whenever possible, point people to a place on your website where they can enter some information, the less the better, and then once you have their information, you can then take them to a page that has the lead magnet available to download, view, or listen to. Prospects need to spend up to seven hours with you before they decide whether or not they're going to buy something from you. So, if you just send an email and expect to make a transaction, you might be successful, but the probability is much higher if you were to send an email, get the prospect to open it with a compelling headline, include a link to a great short and simple lead magnet for them to click on and that helps address one of their problems. That first interaction begins the clock on those seven hours between you and your customer. I'm now going to share with you some headline templates and two other headline writing formulas you can use to create infinite headlines. Here are some basic templates. How to survive X. How to overcome X. The biggest mistake X made. X here can be a celebrity or brand or group of people that your prospect would know. The real secret to X. The fastest way to X. Let me be clear on this one. You do not want to exaggerate or mislead. Always deliver on what your headline promises within your email. Here's a shortcut for X. This one works really well with a lead magnet, something that is simple and low commitment, like a one pager that solves a quick problem for them. How I X, about your X. X here is whatever you're trying to position or sell. Dan Kennedy has a great headline writing formula. His formula is number or trigger word, adjective plus keyword plus promise. Here's another more serious example. Take a bold promise like selling your house in a day. Apply the formula above and you get how you can effortlessly sell your home in less than 24 hours. Note that odd numbers work even better than even numbers and the more strange or unique the number, then the more likely your prospect is to click on it. Neil Patel has a formula in the form of an acronym called SHINE. S for specificity, H for helpfulness, I for immediacy, N for newsworthiness, and E for entertainment value. Think of Neil's formula more as a series of questions your headline should answer. Is it specific to your prospect? Is it helpful? Is it something they need to act on right now? Is it newsworthy? Is it entertaining? The more times you can say yes to each of those questions, the better your headline will be. Okay, so I promised two ways for you to generate infinite headlines. First, I'm going to show you how America's finest news source, The Onion, does so in just 15 minutes. So let's write like The Onion does for 15 minutes a day. Gather all your information together and review it. Make sure you understand the persona that you are trying to reach and the tone of voice and perspective of your company. Then set a timer for 15 minutes. In those 15 minutes, write down as many subject lines about your product or offering as you can. This is going to be really difficult at first. The point here is to do this exercise once a day for 90 days straight. Once you've done something with focus and consistency for 90 days, a lot of amazing things will happen. But of those amazing things, for our purposes, the one to pay attention to is that you will now be able to churn out headlines better than 99% of people on this planet. Thus, infinite headlines in as little as 15 minutes. Cool, right? This is the first part of the process for the Onion writers. The second is that they then get together once a week and share their headlines. Hundreds of headlines are considered, but only a dozen are selected each week. We'll help you whittle down your headline options using A-B testing later on at the end of this class. And if you stick with something for 90 days, it also becomes a habit which means you won't have a problem setting aside 15 minutes a day, and in fact, you might actually be looking forward to it. But what do you do with all those headlines? Go back to our friends at sprout.io. You should have this set up by now if you're following along with this class. So set up a new tree and list out your headlines. Do this every single day. In time, 
This will give you a massive list of headlines you can use for A-B testing before you send your emails out. And again, we'll talk about A-B testing at the end of this masterclass. The point here is to crowd all of your headlines in one place so you don't lose them. That's why I like dedicated uses of cloud-based services like Sprout. You don't need to scramble to find all of your stuff. You have it all in one place and can access it from anywhere. This is going to be important because as you get into the rhythm of writing headlines, good ones are just going to come to you and you're going to want to quickly write it down and collect it with others. So what's the other way to generate infinite headlines? Let me introduce you to our friends at Jasper.ai. Jasper is not a cheap option, just to be clear. In fact, if you're on a tight budget or if your company has a tight marketing budget, we recommend the 15 minute a day exercise. But if you have some extra money or you don't have the time to dedicate 15 minutes a day to writing great headlines, then Jasper is worthy of your time and consideration. It will take us a couple hours to explain the entire intricacies of Jasper, so I'm just going to give you a quick high-level tutorial here on producing great headlines. And if you're interested in learning more, we recommend you check out Jasper's Bootcamp to get started. It's free and it's in the video description below. Step one, the most important part of Jasper is the content brief section. If you want to use Jasper to create headlines for you, you'll need to tell it how many you want, what the topic is, what the niche is, and who the audience is for these headlines. You can see me doing this on the screenshot over here. Step two is once you've filled out your creative brief, you can issue Jasper a command. This is a lot of fun, but you have to be careful because Jasper only has the context you provide it, so you want to be as detailed as possible with your brief. The commands for Jasper, if you're using boss mode, which is one of their paid tiers, can be written like you're writing for a human. In the above example, I wrote at the top of the document, Jasper, write 20 headlines about webinars geared towards readers in the B2B SaaS space who work as CMOs. The headlines should explain how webinars can become a conversion machines for their business. No. There's a Surfer SEO integration with Jasper that will help you find and gauge how high performing a keyword can be in terms of search volume, but that's beyond the scope of this class. All you need to know here is that I wanted webinars in the keyword section under the brief so that Jasper knows to place the word early in the headline, which it did so fabulously. Step three, now all you need to do is press command return or control enter and Jasper will begin to give you headlines. But it won't give you all 20, so just keep on hitting Command Return or Control Enter and you'll get your 20. Jasper has two different modes. The previous example was in Focus Mode, which is the default mode. There's also a Power Mode with all sorts of plug and play templates. But we honestly prefer the process demonstrated here to create headlines. One last thing on Jasper, the more you enter information in your content brief, the smarter it will get in terms of the headlines it produces for you. So for example, after it gives you 20 headlines, you can start writing more information about your prospect or your webinars, and then give it some, and give it the same command again to write those headlines, and this will produce better results. But like with anything involving artificial intelligence, it's not as intelligent as we'd like it to be. So make sure you read over what Jasper gives you carefully. Sometimes you'll get absolute gibberish. Think of it like this. If you throw a ball for your dog, your dog is going to know to run and retrieve the ball. Unless you have my dog. In which case, he'll want you to chase after him once he gets the ball. Jasper is like my dog. Sometimes he'll respond the way you want, and other times he'll just do his own thing. So be patient, read the support documentation, and watch the educational videos Jasper puts out to really learn the ins and outs of this system. Now we're gonna move on to step five in the next video. Welcome back to step five. In step five, I'm gonna teach you how to keep your emails out of the promotions tab. Okay, let's take a quick breather here with our shortest step. This one is very important, but also very simple. Your goal is to avoid the promotions tab in Gmail at all costs. There is a very simple way to do this, but a lot 
of marketing departments won't like it. And that's because basically we want you to throw out all the expensive graphics and templates you're using and send plain text emails to your prospects with riveting headlines and email copy that is less than 250 words. That doesn't leave a whole lot of room for flashiness, you know? Save the flashiness for your website. If you want to jazz up your emails, you can use one GIF or GIF, however you pronounce it, or better still, you can send a link to an unlisted YouTube video that can act as a personal VSL, a video sales letter. I'll tell you how to write one of these in just one moment. But first, here's a short list of things you can do to avoid the promotions tab within Gmail. Step number one, avoid any spam trigger words in your subject line. See our list from the first step. Step number two, remove all your fancy graphics and templates. Send plain text emails with riveting subject lines. Step three, keep the email to 250 words or less. Remember that most people skim their emails, so shorter is always better. Step number four, make sure you have personalized your email and sent your email during a time that a normal human would be looking at their email. No 3 a.m. emails, you know what I mean? Here's a pro tip. Send your emails between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. to maximize the probability of them being seen. Step number five, you may use one animated GIF if you don't like all the plain text. Step number six, include a link to an unlisted YouTube video addressed directly to the person that you are emailing and have them click on the link to view the video. Them clicking on your link tells Gmail that your email is important and lowers the probability of future emails from you to this prospect ending up outside of their inbox. Step number seven, remember to avoid the promotions tab. The prospect must open your email, click the link that you sent them to your VSL, and then respond to your email. The more that this happens, the lower the probability of ending up in the promotions tab. Step number eight, if you are sending an email using a list of prospects, make sure that list is highly segmented and specific. Utilizing email blasts from Sears Insight, you will be able to create those lists within Salesforce and highly segment all those lists for your prospects before you send out those emails to help you stay out of the promotions tab. An email sent to many prospects on a big list will definitely get flagged by Gmail eventually. So smaller, more specific lists of prospects are what you want to use. And also, if a prospect hasn't been active or responded to any emails in the past 90 days, then just remove them from your list entirely. Don't keep people on your email list who don't open or look at the emails you're sending. This is also a signal Gmail can pick up on from your email service provider and move you to the promotions tab. And finally, step number nine, once you've entered into a relationship with your prospects, you can ask them to make sure your email is delivered to your inbox and to their inbox right away by dragging the email out of the promotions tab and dropping them into the inbox. This is something you'll have to remind people to do in every email. So I recommend including this as a call to action in your postscript, your PS, and putting it at the bottom of your email with a very clear unsubscribed link next to it. Okay, before moving on, let's take a moment here to discuss how to create a simple video sales letter, the VSL that we were talking about before. I want to stress the word simple. We could easily do a whole second masterclass just on VSLs. But for now, I'm going to give you a very basic framework presented by John Benson, the inventor of the VSL, to follow. I've made a slight tweak to John's formula by giving you an idea of how long each section of the video should be. And just to be clear, you don't need any professional equipment to make a VSL. You can make a great video sales letter on your smartphone right now. All you need to do is record a brief, no more than two minute video that follows each of these steps. Step number one is the introduction. Get their attention in 15 seconds or less by leading with an incredible fact or piece of information that catches their viewers attention. Step number two is the story. Give them a quick story about a customer just like your prospect who had a problem similar to theirs and used your service to reach their desired outcome. 
Better yet, if you can cut to some footage of one of your customers telling this story themselves, then that would be excellent. This should be about 45 seconds. Step number three is the hook. Remember that the whole section we discussed on value propositions, that's your hook. Answer the question, what's in it for me and how will using this product make others feel about your prospect, about me? This should be about 30 seconds. And step number four is the pitch. This is your call to action. Ask them to schedule or book a meeting by replying to your email. Using Serious Insight, you can drop a book meeting button, which is a direct time slot button into your email message and say, hey, book a meeting with me at 10 o'clock. They click 10 o'clock and it automatically books on your calendar and their calendar. You can also send a calendar scheduling link that will give them the complete view of your calendar where they can book any open time slot you have available. Okay, now we're done with step number five. In step number six, I'm going to teach you how to build a lead magnet. Okay, welcome back to step number six, how to build a lead magnet. I'll tell you a fun trick about lead magnets. If you did all the research I suggested you do earlier in this masterclass, then it is very easy to make a great lead magnet. Now, this section can be a little tricky because to generate a lead magnet, we have to first identify the steps your customer needs to take in order to reach their desired state. So those steps are going to vary depending on who your customer is. Once you've identified those steps, they should be broken down into smaller achievable steps. This is where your lead magnet comes in. Your lead magnet represents a guide to help your customer achieve one of those smaller steps. Remember, a lead magnet is what you create in exchange for someone's email address. And email is the most powerful way to communicate and connect with anyone anywhere on this planet, right? So naturally people are going to guard their emails. There must be a transaction. And that's why your lead magnet has to be something actionable, immediately useful, and helps get your customer closer to achieving one of the steps that they will ultimately need to reach their desired state. Your job with any lead magnet you create is to empower and uplift your customer and make them feel like the change they're looking for is possible. This will build your credibility and your company's credibility within the prospect regardless of what that change is, right? We all want change. When you buy a product like Serious Insight, you're buying time back that you can then reinvest in yourself and upskill yourself. And you let our product and our platform do the tedious work of data entry for you. That time can then be used to do whatever you want to do to become a better representative of your company. So you're not just buying a product whenever you buy a product. You're buying something that you hope will help you get to your desired state, whatever that may be. Now, let me give you a few key points to remember before I show you how to make a lead magnet. First, you have to capture and gain the interest and eventually the trust of your prospect. The best way to do this is through solid copywriting and taking a strong position about something. Strong position. So if you are a company that wants to help other companies recruit and retain members of Generation Z, and you do this through teaching your clients how to craft webinars everyone would want to watch, you can take this slam dunk approach, in my opinion, that webinars suck. Webinars suck will absolutely get any business professional's attention. Heck, I'll even go out on a limb and say that webinar suck is one of those rare statements that would get most people's attention because we've all been subjected to one webinar or another throughout the pandemic and they suck. So take a strong position and get people's attention using some of the exercises I've already shown you, like the onion headline writing method. Second. I want you to know that every lead magnet follows a very specific and successful framework. They start with a hook, webinars suck. Then they tell you a story about whatever useful information is inside them. Then they tell you the information, and then they tell you the same information, but this time from the form of an actual customer, as in a testimonial. Now that I've told you this, it's also possible that I've ruined every business book you've ever read because now that you know they all use the same framework, you'll not be able to unsee it. 
So follow the format. Finally, and this just builds on the last point, you want to always turn your customers into celebrities. Feature them in whatever way they can. A lead magnet is a great place to do that because it provides a third party testimonial about yourself or your product and people will always listen to what others have to say about you or your product and not just what you say about yourself. Oh, and write one more thing. Make sure that the actionable information you provide to your lead magnet will actually work in getting a quick win for the person reading it. If they are seeing some kind of immediate benefit from the information you just provided them, then they're now one step closer to knowing, liking, and trusting you. No, like, and trust leads to a customer spending more time with you. And the more time they spend, the more likely they are to buy with you. And these customers are great because once they've purchased one thing from you, they'll likely do so again. Remember how I was talking about quick wins? Let's do that right now. Let me show you how quickly you can build a very nice looking lead magnet using Canva. So I'm going to turn to my computer screen. We're going to jump on the screen. I'm going to show you how to create a great looking lead magnet utilizing Canva. Essentially, what you want to do is just fill out those lead magnets with all the relevant information that you want to provide your prospect a quick win right now. I've included a link in the description below to a super helpful crash course on editing and using Canva to make lead magnets. So just follow along at the YouTube video below and you'll be off to a great start. Now, using your very appealing looking lead magnet, use the framework we discussed earlier, lead with your hook, tell them the story of how you came to acquire this information and then share that information. When you're done, share the information again, but this time use your customers to do it for you. Then close with your offer. You can have a solid lead magnet done in an hour if you've already done the rest of what we've discussed in this masterclass. If you don't know where to start, I suggest providing a listicle that has an odd number in the title. As an example, 11 ways you can immediately improve your webinars is an example of a title I would use for the lead magnet we discussed earlier. Feel free to steal that one and then list the 11 steps you use that can provide the prospects with helpful information for them. Right now, reach that first step on their journey. Start with your hook. Tell the story of how you acquired this knowledge you're about to share, then list the 11 things they can do right now that will immediately help them Share with them customer testimonials if you have them from others who have completed these 11 steps that you want to suggest to your new prospect. Then close with your offer. And this is how to create a great lead magnet. Now, in step seven, we're gonna be putting everything that we've learned in this masterclass all together. So thank you so much and I'll see you at step seven. Welcome back to step seven where we will be putting all of what we learned together. In this masterclass, I've taught you how to write subject lines that are unique, specific, and helpful for your prospects. Keep your emails out of the Gmail promotions tab or worse, the spam folder. Construct a high performing lead magnet that works in getting your prospects attention, time, and email addresses. And before we wrap up, there's one more thing we have to cover and that's testing. There are a lot of ways to test. And like developing a lead magnet, these methods are going to differ based on the specific action that you are asking your customers to take. That said, there's a framework to keep in mind for any time you want to test something on the internet. First is a hypothesis. You're going to want to write down somewhere what the thing is that you are trying to test. I know that sounds really basic and it is, but you wouldn't believe how often people skip this step. So write down what it is that you want to test. Then in your next step, you're going to want to write down what your specific quantifiable measurements of success are. 
In the case of something like a lead magnet, you can look at your success rate in getting people's email addresses and then from the people who have looked at the lead magnet, the number of inbound businesses you've generated. That could be a quantifiable measurement of success for you. That's pretty much testing in its most basic form. Did the thing I thought would happen, happen? From there, you can get more granular. If we're sticking to our lead magnet example, you're going to test a landing page for that lead magnet. This is especially important because as we talked about earlier, you never want to send someone an attachment by email because doing so is a guaranteed trip to the promotions tab or worse, even a spam filter. Instead, you'll want to set up a landing page and provide a link to it within your email. You can also skip this step and upload your landing page to a Google Drive or your lead magnet to a Google Drive and then share that link out as well. If you do make a landing page, you now will want to expand your test by experimenting with the copy, then the imagery, then the colors used on your CTA buttons, and then the copy of those CTA buttons. Make sure you follow it in that order. Copy, images, colors, then copy again. The point here is to stop and test out your hypothesis as much as possible. Doing so will increase the probability of your success. That being said, don't make yourself crazy either. You can use tools like Cirrus Insights Buyer Signals to see when a prospect or if a prospect open your email, which link they clicked on within the email, and if they landed on your web page or landing page that you linked it to. That's pretty much what Buyer Signals does. Did they open your email? Did they click the link? Where did they land on the web page? Did they land on the web page? In many cases, that is more than enough information to gauge your success on. Once you're done testing these elements, you'll then want to evaluate the data. Sometimes you might find that the thing you thought was true was completely wrong. That doesn't mean you made a mistake or anything like that. This kind of result happens all the time in the world of testing because the truth is people are not always honest about why they do what they do. What they say they'll do and what they actually do are often very different. And that's why it's so important to test any piece of content out that you're trying to share with someone. So remember, write down the thing you want to test, write down the quantifiable measurements you want to use to determine if the thing you're testing works or not, and then run some experiments. Look at the data, and change course if needed. So let's run through how to run an email test. Step one is you want to establish your criteria for success. In every test, pick one element of your email that you want to measure. For our purposes, we focused our webinar on writing great subject lines that get people to open the email and then click on the single link you're sending them within the email. Remember, one email, one CTA that utilize one link. So you'll want to run a test for the subject lines with the first criteria of success being an open rate. Most email service providers have tools that will let you run an AB tests or AA tests. If you don't have an email service provider, you can use email blast within the Sirius insight sidebar to send out mass email communications directly from your inbox. Or if you want to use a service provider outside of email inbox entirely, then you can use something called ConvertKit. I really like ConvertKit because of the large amount of support and educational material they provide with it on their platform. And it's very helpful and easy to use for building landing pages as well. The second step is you'll want to perform what's called an AA test. This is when the email you send is exactly the same, but sent to two different groups of people with the expectation that they will act on the email as sent without encountering any problems like broken links or bad formatting. However, you shouldn't have to worry about formatting because we suggested you remove all the graphics and templates from your email to start with. But this is a good opportunity to see if that one GIF that you send is displaying as expected. If everyone in this group responds in the same way, then you're ready for the next step. And if they don't, then look over the email and fix what needs to be fixed. Step number three is we're going to run an A-B test. Here, you're going to test out your top two to three subject lines that you generated from the many headlines you generated from the headline writing exercise. You did do the exercise, right? 
You'll then send your email to two groups and whichever headline performs the best, then that's the one you'll use. What's great about A-B testing is that it allows you to test every element of your email, including the body copy and the copy you use and the single link that you send. Once you have this performance that you're looking for from your test group, you can now feel free to send your fully optimized email to your entire list of prospects. Again, you're welcome to use Email Blast from Cirrus Insight to do this and configure that group of prospects within a Salesforce campaign or a list view or a CSV upload. And just like that, we've come to the end of this masterclass. In it, I've showed you how to gather information on your prospects, where to find great headlines and how to write your own, how to keep your email out of the promotions tab and how to provide and test a valuable lead magnet that will capture the interest of your prospects. I really hope that you've enjoyed this class. And if you choose to reach out to your prospects using Cirrus Insight or have any questions about how to use our product, then please reach out and email us at una, that's U-N-A, at CirrusInsight.com. And if you aren't using Cirrus Insight, I hope I can convince you to give us a 14-day free trial by visiting CirrusInsight.com. You don't need a credit card, and you'll find tools like buyer signals and email blasts in the scheduling tool that I've showed you and talked about throughout this webinar. I'm Austin Deering, and on behalf of Cirrus Insight, thank you so much for watching. Stay classy, internet.